People say that British history didn't do things by revolution. That was something for Europe and the Americas. But revolutions often start with riots. Look at the French Revolution, which started with a riot at the Bastille. And Britain has had its fair share of riots. One of those riots that could have become something bigger took place in the Welsh town of Merthyr in the summer of 1831. People say that the Merthyr Rising was the first incident of organised workers' unrest against low wages and poor working conditions anywhere in the world after the start of the Industrial Revolution. And that's especially cool as far as I'm concerned because I grew up in South Wales. I'm Luke Pierce, and this is the Radical History Channel, where we explore the riots, the revolutions and the reforms which changed the world. Keep watching for the story of the riot which created the famous red flag and which martyred a probably innocent man. The Welsh town of Merthyr was a key location in the Industrial Revolution because the surrounding hills contained both coal and iron ore. By the beginning of the 19th century, it was the largest town in Wales, containing half of the South Wales ironworks and producing 40% of British pig iron. A frontier town like Merthyr sounds like an exciting place to be just as the Industrial Revolution got going, but for your average worker, living conditions were pretty poor and it was a place where half of children would die before their fifth birthday. An economic crisis in the late 1820s forced some of the Merthyr ironworks to close, with falling wages for those who were lucky enough to keep their jobs. Families came on hard times and ruthless bailiffs would confiscate property to pay down debts. Another sore point was that some workers were paid via the truck system rather than real wages. This meant they were paid in credit vouchers which were redeemable at shops owned by their employers. The 1820s and 30s meanwhile were a time of political tension in Britain. New urban business owners wanted more political representation for the cities, whereas the historic aristocracy wanted to restrict the right to vote to a few big landowners. It's easy to be fooled when looking at radical history into thinking that society was split into a kind of rich versus poor, owner versus worker dichotomy whose interests were always opposed. But things were often more complicated than that. William Crawshay, for example, was an ironmaster in Merthyr. He was known as a Whig and supported political reform and free trade which would lower food prices for his workers, both of which were opposed by the Conservative Party at the time. Even though the political reforms being advocated at that stage wouldn't have given workers the vote, Crawshay was happy to encourage reform sentiments among his employees, many of whom saw any kind of change as at least a first step towards a future where workers themselves might have more power. Since the recession of the 1820s, Crawshay had also kept up production and wages in his ironworks, where other rivals had cut back. We can assume that Crawshay had his own motivations for supporting workers in this way. The point here is that employers like Crawshay were treading a fine line between calls for change on the one hand and maintaining existing power dynamics on the other. So we can actually identify several triggers for riots in Merthyr by the summer of 1831. Firstly, the proposed parliamentary reform bill was defeated, a blow to workers' future political hopes. Secondly, William Crawshay decided that he could no longer keep up iron production and wages, so he cut back in a direct hit to workers' economic interests. And thirdly, I think we can say that the ongoing truck system and penalties for debtors was a blow to many workers' sense of pride and control over their lives. On the 30th of May, there was a rally where iron miners got together and made a list of demands, including abolishing prison sentences for debt and stabilising wages. Protests then spread to nearby towns and villages. The crowd in Merthyr shouted in Welsh, Caus a bara, which meant that they wanted more than mere bread to survive. And also, Ilaur ar Brenin, down with the king, which I assume meant King William IV, who reigned at the time, but it might also have been a reference to their boss, William Crawshay, who at some point in his life was known as the Iron King. As well as these chants, the crowd used a couple of symbols, a pike skewered with a loaf of bread on the end, which basically said, give us our bread or else, and someone daubed a sheet in calves' blood and then hoisted the red flag, apparently the first time that this was ever done as a symbol of workers' power. In an outpouring of anger, rioters attacked the local debtors' court and destroyed records. They also confiscated property for middle-class households. This caused the government to send in the 93rd Regiment of Foot, but the crowd was too big to be split up, so the soldiers could only protect essential buildings and people. On the 2nd of June, local employers and magistrates met the High Sheriff of Glamorgan in the Castle Inn. A group led by a man named Lewis Lewis went there to demand a reduction in the price of bread and an increase in wages. Lewis Lewis was known in Welsh by the far cooler name of Lucin and Heliod, which literally means Lewis the Hunter. Their demands were rejected and so the group attacked the inn and clashed with troops. The rioters managed to steal many weapons, but the battle resulted in hundreds of injuries. Soldiers withdrew to Penedaran House and the town was effectively controlled by the rioters. This armed insurrection was actually quite organised. Some of the men had military experience and used this to ambush soldiers and local police forces, known as yeomanry. But there was a division among the workers, with 
with some wanting to assault Penydown House and others open to discussions. The rioters arranged a mass meeting for Sunday the 6th of June to decide on the next steps. 12,000 rioters showed up, but so did 450 soldiers with weapons ready and they dispersed the crowd. By the 7th of June, the town was effectively under the control of the authorities once again, with 24 rioters dead. 26 people were arrested and put on trial. Some were imprisoned, others were sent to Australia, and two were sentenced to death by hanging, including Lewis Lewis for robbery and another man named Richard Lewis. Because all Welsh heroes have to have cool nicknames, this Richard guy was known as Dick Penderyn after the town that he was from. He was convicted of stabbing a soldier, Private Donald Black, in the leg with a bayonet attached to a gun. Now, Private Black's injuries weren't fatal, and he didn't identify either of the Lewises as the culprit. The authorities were trying to find a balance between punishing perpetrators to discourage future rioters, but not creating so much anger with overzealous sentences that they encouraged a new riot. Lucin and Hellier's sentence was reduced to penal transportation after a police officer testified that Lewis had tried to shield him from the rioters. He was deported and died in 1847 in Australia. 11,000 local people, meanwhile, signed a petition protesting the innocence of Richard Lewis, Dick Penderyn, saying that he hadn't stabbed the soldier in the leg. The Home Secretary, Lord Melbourne, agreed agreed to delay the execution by two weeks, but he didn't stop it. And ultimately, Dick Pendone was hanged in Cardiff Market on the 13th of August, 1831. He was only 23 years old, and his last words were Or Adgloid, Dama Gamwed, O Lord, this is injustice. People saw him as a martyr, a symbol of damaged relations between Welsh workers and the authorities. In 1874, the Reverend Evan Evans claimed that a man named Yanto Parker had made a deathbed confession to stabbing the soldier's leg in Merthyr, but had then run away to America fearing arrest. James Abbott, who testified against Richard Lewis at the trial, also admitted to having lied under oath. For Dick Penderyn, it probably would have been nice if these guys had spoken up 40 years earlier, but there you go. At one point in recent years, there was a campaign to grant a retrospective pardon for Dick Penderyn. A petition was presented by Stephen Kinnock MP to the House of Commons in 2016, but it only had 600 signatures, not enough to trigger a debate. What was the legacy of the rising? Well, lots of new trade union lodges were set up in the local area in the aftermath. But I think it's fair to ask the question, why didn't the Rising go further? Why didn't this turn into something like the French Revolution? The answer to that, I think, is that the Merthyr rebels didn't have a clear political direction or a programme for reform that could have galvanised support across the country. That was still to come. The Merthyr Rising inspired the developing Chartist movement and was a loud call for some kind of universal change which went way beyond the reform campaign of the time. In 1839, Lord Melbourne, who was by then Prime Minister, said regarding South Wales, It is the worst and most formidable district in the kingdom. The affair we had there in 1831 was the most like a fight of anything that took place. And as someone who grew up in South Wales, I can testify that our tendency to cause trouble for the rest of the kingdom remains strong. I hope you enjoyed this video about the Merthyr Rising. If you did, then you might also enjoy one of my other videos from the exact same period of history about the Tollpuddle Martyrs. These were six guys from the village of Tollpuddle in Dorset who were banished to Australia for the simple act of forming a trade union. You should be able to click on the video somewhere around here. Please like and subscribe and tell your friends about the Radical History channel. Take care of yourselves and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.